everybody and welcome to open education as I see you all coming in and making yourselves comfortable. I just heard recording in progress as I was writing an email and I was like, oh my gosh, here we are. <laughs> um, so uh, today we are going to be discussing uh, poetics, politics and paradoxes of sand with Nehal El Hadi, uh, who is joining us from Toronto, if I'm correct. Correct, Nehal? Yes. And, um, you know, there's a tradition at Open EDU as everybody um, makes the, them, themselves comfortable opening up their laptops and computers or tablets or phones <laughs> and getting ready to just absorb this wonderful class that we have ahead. We always ask folks in the chat to say hello from wherever they are in the world. So that's one of our little traditions. If you open up the chat, you're gonna see um, a little bit of a breath of the international community that joins us weekly. Um, ah, it's starting to pop. It always is a moment that gives me goosebumps <laughs> just to feel so connected with people of the global majority global south represent um we're so honored to have you all join us um weekly in this wonderful community where we're able to discuss deep issues deep topics um so take a moment Nehal, just to take a look at everybody where they're coming from and as they say hello um and of course, if you know the indigenous land uh, that you are on, definitely uh, please mention it. Uh, I see here occupied Duwamish territory, Tongba, Chumash territory, um, unceded, ah, oh, it's going too fast, unceded Duwamish land, which is Seattle. Um, and we have Latvia, India, Italy, Colombia, <laughs> Berlin. So super exciting to see everybody uh, joining us. We're so honored. Thank you so much for your ongoing support. And I hope that open education provides you with the kind of knowledge and access that you need to change the world from where you're standing and to build confidence in your knowledge base and to deepen your knowledge if that's the case. We're, um, I went live this week to talk a little bit about this class and to invite folks. I just went randomly live on my um, Instagram because you know, we are alone absorbing all of these news that are happening, Amnesty International launching their report on apartheid in Pal occupied Palestine. And um, at the same time, what happened with Whoopi Goldberg, at the same time, what's going on with, you know, the war on books in the United States, the war on critical race theory in the United States, at the same time, the invasion of Ukraine, the bombing in Syria from the United States to killing 10 civilians, you know, to, to, to manage to capture one ISIS member. And all of that, and we are alone, you know, just absorbing all of these news and we have no space to discuss them. And so I'm hoping Open Education provides a place in Slack uh, within this community here after the Q&A uh, are starting, just to be able to discuss and to analyze and process all of these things that are occurring in real time. It's about to be 12.05 PST, uh, EST, PM EST. That's why I, missed, I made a mistake. And that's the time where we begin this class, just allowing everybody to settle down and, and, and take their space. So without further ado, please welcome Nehal El Hadi. Uh, as I said, I will not be reading your bio. So in your words, Nehal, please introduce yourself. I'm gonna turn my camera off and I'll be right back for Q&A. Thank you. My name is Nihal Al Hadi. I'm an editor and writer based in Toronto, which is Treaty 13 territory. Um, and I'm here today to talk about sand. Prelude. I have a body memory of sand. The actual event happened when I was seven or eight. At the time, my family lived in a suburb of Khartoum, the capital city of Sudan, 
in a second floor two bedroom flat with a massive balcony. There's a weather phenomenon in Sudan called the Havub, a particular type of sandstorm where the wind scoops up the desert and dumps it on the city, like a blizzard, but make it sand. On that day, there was a Havub. Usually, everyone takes shelter. Cars pull over, people head indoors. They take their animals with them, but even the strays get ghost. It can be dangerous to move around in a Havub. The blowing sand reduces visibility. I don't remember if I snuck outside or if I was forgotten outside, but I remember being surprised by the silence. Khartoum is noisy, a large collaborative raucousness, honking cars and squealing brakes. Street vegetable vendors yelling out their wares, customers shouting back their orders. Sheep bleeding, street dogs barking. The calls to prayer, one muazzin after the other, after the other, after the other. Music in between, noisy. But not on that day. I'm drawn to silence and I wanted to remain in it. You know those scenes in movies where everything freezes and a character walked through stunned? Time did that, like it stopped, everything stopped. I could see the haboob approaching, the tall, 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 terrifying, reddish golden wall of sand moving towards us, swallowing up the blue sky and the city, eating up space and time. I stayed. I saw it coming and I stayed. It was sudden. Sand was everywhere, everywhere. I could barely see my hands if I held them out in front of me and I had to hold my dress over my face to breathe. I felt each grain sting my body like a glass splinter. I had to keep my head down to shield my eyes. I curled into a ball on the ground. I don't know how long I was there. 13 seconds, seven minutes, forever. I don't know. I stayed outside for the entire storm. And when the wind started to die down enough for me to move around safely, I thought I would get a head start on the cleanup. I found a broom and I started sweeping. It did nothing. And at first, the futility was euphoric. It didn't matter what I did. It was going to accomplish nothing. And I still swept until I was exhausted, until the haboob stopped. The city unpaused itself and the sounds picked up right where they had left off. I was found outside and told to go and wash. It's been decades and I can still remember what it feels like to have immeasurable grains of sand whip against my skin. I can summon the feeling of sand grains ricocheting off my face, getting into my mouth, my throat. I feel them in the folds of my body, a sandpaper between fabric and skin. And until now, some days I wake up with the grit on the tip of my tongue as it presses against the back of my teeth. I'm still spitting sand. Thank you, Celine, for inviting me here. Thank you, Slow Factory, for hosting this platform. Thank you to Nicole and Nick for their hard work and support behind the scenes. And thank you to Sarika and Mac for ASL interpreting today. Thank you also to all of you who are listening today. I very much appreciate your time and attention, and I'm grateful that you chose to spend them with me. I'm really excited to be here. As you're about to see, I'm kind of strangely and really passionately obsessed with sand. And by the end of this talk, I hope that you are too. I'm going to talk about sand as both a literal and a metaphorical matter or substance through which we can grasp the complicated environmental, social, and political issues we're dealing with today. I'm going to point out some of the ways in which sand is inextricable for, from what it means for us to be human in this world. And because of this, understanding our relationships with sand means understanding our place in the world. The illustrations that accompany this talk are by my dear friend and longtime collaborator, Coco Guzman. I'm hella appreciative that they help visualize my work and their style. Today, I'm going to begin by explaining what sand is, and it's, it's pretty clear cut. Um, but I'm also going to look at the ways we use sand and what its extraction has resulted in environmentally, economically, and politically. 
I'm then going to talk about how sand moves around the world through global shipping and weather patterns. And about weather patterns, I'm going to look at what climate change has done to and with sand. I'm also going to talk about sand geographies, most significantly deserts and desert borders. And finally, I'm going to suggest that if we consider our relationships with sand, that there are tangible things and actions that we can do that can help us work towards addressing not only climate change, but also other serious and deadly issues. I will make the bold proposition that an approach that incorporates Black geographies and Black materialism can help us both make sense and take action. I'm going to cover a lot, but this talk will be recorded so you can revisit it. And I'll also have a list of resources available in case you want to find out more. For those of you who are listening now, I like a really rowdy chat. I find that talking online is still a little bit unsettling. Um, so I love seeing the chat get lively. Please use it to respond in real time to what I'm saying. I'll kind of look at it out of the corner of my eye, but I'll actually spend time with it after the, after the talk. There will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end using the Q&A feature. I'm about to make several statements that could be perceived as melodramatic, but please just indulge me because I couldn't possibly undersell this. Some of the statements I'm going to make today include, sand is the material that matters most to what it means for us to be human and our worlds are made out of sand. And no less epic or true, the world is running out of sand. The title of this talk is Poetics, Politics, and Paradoxes of Sand. Poetics because sand infiltrates our languages and desires. It's the material we associate most with temporality. Poetics because sand is beautiful, is made beautiful, and can make beautiful. Because the language of sand, its poetry, is in our words, in the beauty of landscape even in the music that sand produces, a natural phenomenon known as song of the sand or singing sands. We use sand to refer to the passage of time, literally in hourglasses and metaphorically when we talk about the ephemeral nature of things. Footprints in the sand, built on sand. We use sandboxes as a metaphor for creative thinking, arenas for battle and competition. If we behave like sand, it puts us at the mercy of the wind that blows it around, but sand or grit in our character reflects strength. Politics, because sand's movement around the world and our movements on sand are established, controlled, and determined by states and markets. And paradoxes. A paradox is something that contains two opposite things that happen to be true at the same time, like, Sand is plentiful and we're running out of sand. A grain of sand is minuscule, but sand can, can shape mountains. And the meta paradox that underpins my talk today, sand builds our worlds and our demand for sand is destroying our world. So what is sand? It's a granular material made of broken down rocks, minerals and organic matter. Sand grains are about 1 16th of a millimeter to two millimeters in diameter. Anything smaller is silt, anything bigger is gravel. It's really difficult, energy extensive and really expensive to make sand by breaking down rock. Also sand that is made by breaking down rock is too sharp and jagged. Sand is formed out of so many things, mainly rock that's been broken down by water or wind. Its colors indicate either its mineral content or interaction with other creatures. The organic matter obviously comes from decomposed bodies, like of creatures, of people, of plants, everything. Black sand comes from basalt, pink sand comes from coral, white sand can either be gypsum or parrotfish poop. Iron compounds, iron compounds make sand yellow, orange, or red like in the desert. Sand builds everything around us. We use sand to make concrete, glass, tech devices. We use sand to extract oil and petroleum. There is no human progress, civilization, innovation, discoveries without sand, and it's so mundane that it doesn't even register. Sand is a key ingredient in both concrete, in both concrete and cement. 
Quartz sand is a source of silicon, used to make silica, silicates, and silicone. Silicon is used in semiconductors and circuitry and glass. Silicon is also the second most abundant element on Earth after oxygen. So it's weird to think about us as running out of sand. So one of the first things to know is that you can't build with desert sand. It's too smooth. Its edges are too round. But beach sand and coastal sand and sand in waterbeds is perfect. That our demand for sand has put us on the brink of an impending environmental catastrophe is something that has come to the forefront in recent years. This is a combination of both rapid urbanization at a large scale and that we are running out of easily extractable sand. I hope to add my voice to a growing chorus of environmental advocates, researchers, journalists, and communities drawing attention to the issue. But in addition, I want to bring an added urgency into this conversation because sand and its environmental, political, economic, and social impacts disproportionately affect Black people. So over the next 30 years, over two thirds of the world's population will live in cities. 90% of this growth will occur in the global south. Remember that cities are built out of sand. Cement and concrete, asphalt, glass, buildings, roads, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. Cities are also built on sand, which makes those sites inaccessible for sand extraction. So what is happening with this global construction boom and these, this growing rate of urbanization is that we need sand at a scale and at a speed which we have never done before. And so there's been this demand for a substance that we considered always there, easily accessible, like you just go out and there's sand that you can take and use. Millions and millions and millions of tons of sand are used in cities each year. So what starts happening is that sooner or later, places start to exhaust easily available sand. And so what happens is that either extract, extraction processes get more environmentally damaging or sand has to be imported from other places causing extraction damage in places where it hadn't been before because the demand wasn't there. So for example, Manhattan is built with sand from Long Island and sand mining in Long Island has caused conflict between environmentalists and residents on one side, sand mining companies and politicians on the other. Sand gets extracted by mining and dredging and the rates at which it has been extracted have led to regulation as a forced response. Rivers dry out, coasts erode, the effects of extraction cascade and become more severe. The global demand from sand has led to it being extracted in places where it had never been before. It is turning into an urgent environmental crisis on the coastal areas of West Africa, where in Sierra Leone alone, coastal erosion because of sand mining is at the rate of six meters per year. Activists there are trying to ban sand mining but it's not happening because now sand is an exportable commodity. The demand for sand has meant that its price has gone up because even though sand is plentiful and abundant in particular areas, it is also heavy, so moving it is expensive. And as places run out of sand and the market demand increases, the price goes up and makes it more valuable. So what happens when there are attempts to regulate sand is that people just start moving to get it from somewhere else. So attempts to regulate sand have resulted in illegal acquisitions of sand, stealing it and smuggling it. There have been headlines over the past decade of sand mafia, sand thieves, sand pirates. Um, it's a pretty serious conflict. And the conflict is between people who steal sand and authorities, but in a lot of these places, the authorities are implicated in the theft of sand. So that's another thing that drives the price up, bribing officials to be able to steal sand but also conflict between local gangs. There's this crazy story in Jamaica about 15 years ago when a beach went missing. 500 truckloads of sand were stolen at the site of a proposed resort. They've never actually figured out 
what happened or why it happened, the theory is that the sand was stolen to stop the development of the resort, which it did. And they think that the sand was redistributed among other beaches in the area, but nobody knows who did it, why or how. In Kenya, Nairobi's construction boom has created an insatiable demand for sand and tens of people have been killed in sand theft incidents in the last five years and dozens more injured in these conflicts. But these examples are endless. There are sand thieves in Morocco where there are um, environmental protection areas to stop people from taking sand, but it happens. Then we also have on the other end of the scale, this like these crazy construction projects like the World Islands of Dubai, which were 300 proposed artificial islands that were supposed to be built by dredging up sand from the sea bottom. And when that proved impossible after a while, sand was important from Australia. But as countries run out of easily extractable sand, the trade in sand is growing and pushing up the price of sand. And as it's not well regulated, this is only a problem that is going to increase in scale, complexity, and deadliness. So I've spoken about how sand has moved across the world due to market forces, but I'd like to talk about how wind and weather move sand across the world. So sand from deserts gets, sand and dust from deserts gets picked up by wind and moved around. And this sand and desert, remember that sand is made out of broken down rock and minerals and organic material. So this organic material and minerals get dumped into the oceans as sand is picked up and moved around the world by the wind. The mineral content of the Atlantic is provided by the Sahara. So is the mineral, so is part of the mineral content of the Amazon. Sand also moves from land into rivers to seas and oceans. And the movement of sand through water, like traveling sand on seabeds, is understudied. And its role in the ecosystem is something that's not well understood, but scientists are arguing that by understanding it, we can actually understand more how ecosystems balance and how to address things like coastal erosion or marine life decimation. This movement of sand from land into rivers and seas and oceans is also what builds and removes beaches over time. Climate change is affecting weather patterns, and this affects how sand travels. I don't know if you guys remember, but a few years ago, there was a storm in Puerto Rico where people were mentioning like sandstorms that were part of the storm system. Three years ago, the United Nations Environment Program established a special interest group to study the changing impacts of sand and dust storms on people. These include health considerations like upper respiratory tract illnesses, as well as disruptions to transportation, communications, and shipping routes. It also includes how sandstorms contribute to desertification and agricultural damage through damage to crops and livestock. So the haboob that I was talking about in my introduction, those things are starting to happen in ways that are having greater impacts, maybe not necessarily simply because of climate change, but owing to increasing populations in areas that are affected by these storms. Um, the kind of, like just a random fact, the kind of sandstorm that I was talking about happens in Sudan and in Arizona. And right now um, they're studying similar sandstorms in weather patterns on Mars. So there was a report that was issued by the United Nations Environment Program that looked at what sand and dust storms were, their impact, how they contributed to the ecosystem and concerns um, surrounding their effects on human activities. In an interview, the author of the report, Nick Middleton, was asked about whether sandstorms could play a role in the, spread of the, in the spread of diseases. And he responded, we still have numerous basic questions to answer regarding dessert derived bioaerosols. It is thought that many of the microorganisms transported in desert dust are capable of causing disease outbreaks in a wide range of organisms, both terrestrial and marine, but we have little data on specific microbes found in dust storms known to cause disease in people and animals. So sand and dust storms are a global environmental problem that affects the health and livelihoods of millions of people across the world. 
I also want to talk about sand geographies, like specifically deserts. Deserts trigger our imagination. They're these wide open expanses. They're talked about in this kind of like romantic, empty, desolate way, but they're not. They're teeming with life and culture and activities. Um, deserts are incredibly lively and dynamic. They're ever shifting. Um, one of the most unusual books that I have ever come across in, in my life actually that I acquired while I was doing this research um, is called The Physics of Blown Sand and Desert Dunes, and it is strangely fascinating. Um, I like, I'm, I'm a sci-fi buff and I have a very soft spot for fictional desert planets like Tatooine and Arrakis. I will talk about those to no end. But today I wanna to talk about um, what I consider one of the most urgent issues related to sand and it's about migrant crossings of deserts. Borders situated in desert environments are particularly deadly to cross. Border control can implicate the desert, employing it as a barrier and a place to abandon people, effectively weaponizing the desert to disappear people. The Sahara is the deadliest migrant crossing in the world. There's been much attention focused, deservedly of course, on migrant crossing of the Mediterranean, and it's been compared to the transatlantic passage when we're looking at the forced displacement of black people. But a lot of those journeys begin in the Sahara before they reach the Western or Northern coast, and attention needs to be played to the geography of the Sahara and the movement of black people. To deal with migrants crossing over the Mediterranean, European governments have armed North Africa have funded, sorry, have funded North African countries to staunch the flow of migrants. And what has happened is that the southernmost borders of these countries have been militarized. They lie in the Sahara. It's actually a really simple matter to weaponize a desert environment against people. All you have to do is scatter them away from their group, disorient them, and then leave them. By preventing people from crossing over, and refusing to assume responsibility for their welfare. They are in effect allowing the desert to kill them. Nobody knows how many people have died in the Sahara over the last decade, but it's estimated to be in the tens of thousands. Right now, it's estimated that for every migrant that drowns in the Mediterranean, two others disappear into the desert. It's not the only desert border where this is happening. The same, the same set of actions happen at the US-Mexico border in the Sonoran Desert, where there the desert environment is so harsh that to track the number of missing migrants, activists count backpacks found. And as the certification increases and intensifies, this is just also a problem that's going to grow. The Missing Migrants Project writes, the majority of recorded death on migration routes through the Sahara Desert are linked to the extreme heat and lack of shelter for migrants in irregular situations, including dehydration, starvation, and exposure, as well as sickness and lack of access to health care, which is likely exacerbated by the extreme environment. So, I mean, I've, I've talked about a lot. I've talked about climate change. I've talked about sand as a commodity. I've talked about the environmental damage that is caused by sand's extraction. I've talked about sand and weather. Um, and so, so what now? Like I've drawn a lot of connections and linkages. Um, there are so many people out there doing incredible work on everything that I have spoken about. And I would highly recommend that, that you look up their work and look into it. But what I would like to do is propose that we can use sand as this tangible way of grasping the connections between the, the most urgent issues we're dealing with today. And so I propose a framework that relies on black materialism, which is the effect of matter on black people and black geographies. So a black materialist approach takes into consideration how the materiality of sand and its extraction, distribution, and uses 
affect specifically affect people of African descent. And that includes coastal erosion on the west coast of Africa. It looks at the labor of Black people who extract sand and who are involved in it. And I'm not saying that these issues are unique to people of African descent. I'm just saying that it relates to the most pressing social issues of our time in a particular way. And Black Geographies brings into focus networks and relations of power, resistance, histories, and the everyday. There's a really great book by environmental journalist Vince Beiser called The World in a Grain, published in 2018. And this outlines the ways in which urbanization has fueled the demand for sand to a point where it is untenable for us to perceive the way we have been in its extraction and consumption. In this book, Beiser outlines the history of concrete, glass, and asphalt, sand's role in digital technologies and the digital revolution, the growing global market in sand and its devastating effects on the local scale, and how sand is changing the shape of the world by eroding, coast, by eroding coastlines and new island builds. It's an excellent and accessible overview. I highly recommend it. In it, Beiser writes, sand is just one aspect, one element of the much larger problem of overconsumption. If we're running out of that, we really need to think about how we're using everything. I've spoken about what sand is and how human sand relationships can provide a solid and tangible framework through which to understand the world and our place in it. Sand is the material that matters most to what it means for us to be human. I've quickly run through what sand is used for, where it comes from and where it goes, and how its extraction can damage places, cultures, and livelihoods. I've hopefully, through poetics, this practice reflected on the beauty of sand and its brutality, especially in the ways that deserts are used as death-producing landscapes. And if there's one thing that I hope you take from this, it's the urgency of addressing that truth. Frank Muller, writing about sand in Rio de Janeiro says, the exercise of government is conditioned by the ability to arrange and dispose of things, including the natural environment, territories, and resources in ways that this or that end may be achieved. Things such as sand do not have agency per se, as if they were determining a specific social structure or behavior. Rather, to understand the governing of sand means to examine its materiality as it sets the stage as well as shapes possibilities for human acts, organizations, and governance arrangements. Agency thus emerges from socio-physical reality as well as human effects and intentions. So awareness is a starting point, and action will need to follow. So the way that sand shows up in our world, the fact that every, if you just look around you right now, Sand has built up the world around you, but it also factors in many different ways that are connected to everything else. So what I've done with sand right now, it's like one of those connect the dots puzzles that you may have done as a child where you have like the dot and the number and you draw the lines between them. So this is, this is my drawing of the lines. This is my understanding and interpretation and the picture that emerges from it. There are human rights advocates, environmental journalists, materials engineers, construction engineers, industrial designers, land use planners, chemists, artists, poets, and more who work with and in relation to sand. I hope I've sparked your curiosity. But more importantly, I hope that I've affected the way that you look at and engage with the world around you. I'd like to end my talk by describing a scene in Abdurrahman Sasako's 2014 film, Timbuktu. The movie tells the stories of people living in Timbuktu, Mali, during its occupation by Islamic militants who imposed Sharia law, banning activities like singing and playing soccer or football. A group of boys and young men in football kits and athletic gear are in a sandy square that you could find in countless neighborhoods. A large empty square with the goal ends marked and where youth would gather to play football. The scene begins from behind the goal's netting. Netting. The scene begins from behind the goal's netting. The players are in position for a match. A young man in a red Adidas t-shirt places an invisible ball on the ground, preparing for kickoff. 
the action pauses before it begins as a donkey strides through the sandy field. And then the game starts. The young men run from one side of the square to another, the presence of the imaginary ball marked on the ground by the sand kicked up by the player's feet. There's no dialogue, only music. It's an evocative and poetic rendition of the beautiful game, the sand punctuating the player's moves, providing the prompts we need to follow the match. I'm very taken by the beauty of the scene, the way the kicks of sand direct our attention to the ball sequence. And as viewers, we realize we don't even need a ball there to mark the moves the sand fills in. That's it from me. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Nehal. Wow, what a wonderful, amazing talk where you tied and connected the dots on so many levels. Thank you for our American Sign Language interpreters, Sarika and Mark. Thank you so much, Nick, for organizing this uh, for us. Um, Nehal, you know, this conversation, the, the depth at which you have you know, presented this work on Sen, I know it has been a long process for you. You've been working on this topic for so long. Can you tell us very quickly about, you know, what, how did you come to work on Sen and and how long has it taken you to study this on, on a systemic level, on a material level, on a social level, political level? So when I, when I posted this talk on, on Instagram, I said that it was a really rare project that I was able to bring all of myself to it. Um, like many people, I wear many different hats. I'm trained as an environmental journalist. Um, I have a PhD in urban planning. I am, I mean, I speak Arabic, I'm from a desert country, and it was just one of these things where sand had different meanings in every different part of my life. And, and I have to say that there's this moment, there's a switch, and I think it started when I was like, well, you know, we talk about consumption, what are the things around us made of? And I'm like, oh, cities are made out of sand. I was like, wait, what? And then just, and then it blew up from there, like it was it was an obsession, you know? Um, people who are close to me will, will tell you that. <laughs> I'm like, yo, look what, look what else I learned about sand. Um, and you come across all this really random information. Like for the Olympics, they actually had to import over 30,000 tons of sand, right? And then it's like all of this like random facts about sand that it was just like, this is, why is nobody talking about this? And so I went and started looking at it. And Vince Beiser's book is the, is the one that is the most overarching. And there are people here and there that are doing different parts. But then people get so siloed. Like if you are an engineer, you look at sand in a particular way. If you're an environmental advocate, you look at sand in a particular way. If you are, um, if you're a migrant right, rights worker, you look at the desert in a particular way. Um, Another thing that I've been working on is that because I'm trained as an environmental journalist, one of the hardest challenges is communicating the complexity of environmental issues to people. And I'm sure you know this, it's not, it's not as simple as like choosing one product over another. Um, and so at the same time as I was like learning all of these things about sound, I was like, this is actually a way to introduce narrative complexity with environmental issues with something so simple, so simple. Absolutely. And just before I dive deeper into the Q&A, I wanted to ask you, you know, the movie Dune <laughs> portrayed <laughs> in such a way, you know, I can't stop myself from not asking you, like, what are your thoughts on Dune? Because we put together a critique of Dune. And of course, we had all these very fan, super uber fan of the original books that were made possible because of the proximity the author had with certain uh, different people uh, throughout his life um, and their relationship to indigenous knowledge. And of course, that's not even mentioned in there, but just to portray the sand dunes as the ultimate death, I'm, I don't know how you perceive that. And I would love to hear your thoughts just before I go into Q&A. Oh my God, you don't know what kind of worms you've opened with June. <laughs> um, I actually, like I grew up reading June, it is, um, I did a panel on Arab science fiction 
And I was like, people think his science fiction is over here and Arab language and culture is over here. But I'm like, you don't actually have Western science fiction without Arab culture. Like the top selling science fiction book of all time is June. That doesn't exist without Arab and desert culture. Cause like not all Arabs are desert and not all desert cultures are Arab. Um, the other thing about June is that Frank Herbert drew, this is like close to my heart. He drew from Sudanese military history to inform some of the battles that happen in June with no, with no recognition of that. Um, and so I'm like reading June and I'm like, but this is, this part of it is Sudanese and this part of it is like from the desert people like that I know. Um, and so I love seeing that reflection. And I, I think it's done in a particular way. Obviously it's open to critique because it's about, you know, rapacious extraction, right? Of somebody's resources and, and not, and disrupting balance unnecessarily. Um, and then also like the savior complex too. But like the literal savior complex, like it doesn't get manifested more than that. Um, but I like that June lets me have these conversations. So, um, and I think that it's, it's such like in, in the latest film that came out, the desert is portrayed like heartbreakingly beautiful. Like you could cry the way that it's filmed. So, uh, I haven't seen the film because I'm protesting it, but um, <laughs> uh, I like the idea that we use it as a platform for conversation. <laughs> I'm like, listen, do you know what Sudan has done for June? <laughs> first of all and also you know the costumes just from a fashion perspective it's all Arab fashion and um you know Arab styles in the way that we drape the our fabrics the like, colors um, Western science fiction does not exist without us <laughs> love it period okay <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I mean, this was not part of the Q&A, but I have been holding this question <laughs> for the whole session. I just, like, I just wait for the moments where people ask me about June. I'm like, yes! Yes! Oh my God, amazing. I, it, this was not planned. Um, but um, yes, definitely. Uh, during the talk, you know, you were so eloquent, so amazing, but there were some parts of it that I, I read in the chat that people were missing out the references. So maybe at the end of this, you could maybe give us a list of resources of references that we can share with the with, the, with our community, just to make sure that the, they, they can catch up as they rewatch this class online eventually when yeah, it's live next week. I, I do have a list of resources and I'll happily share that with you. And amazing, thank you so once. much anything they're welcome like I'm really easy to find online so you're welcome to reach out to me directly and absolutely and I, I see your handle is right here uh for uh, folks who want to follow uh, Nihal and her website as well let's dive into the Q&A I know we have a ton of questions so let's see what we can do I'll go chronologically in Iran we have black sandy beaches on Homer Mosgan Island the sand doesn't look black at daylight, but only at night. And when you shine light on it, it sparkles like a million diamonds. Do you know how this can be? No, but that's got to do with like the mineral content of the sand. Like with black sand, I'd mentioned before that some of it's basalt, if there is a volcanic eruption, um, but I really don't know. It's not that hard to find it out. Like geological organizations will track that. One of the other things that I found that was really interesting is that there is a global subculture of sand collectors. Mm. Yeah, they sand from different parts of the world and they will trade it with each other, but who will also like assess the sand. Now, one of, one of the things that I've also been working on as part of this is that sand contains memory, right? It, it contains a record of what happened, not necessarily in the place that where it is because like I said, sand travels, but it contains a record of, of things over time. So whatever made the sand, and that, that actually sounds really, really beautiful. I would, I'd love to see that in Iran. Um, so wow. what- Sand contains memory. I have full body goosebumps. <laughs> there's a quote, hold up. Let me see if I can find it because I love it. And it's not by me. Unfortunately, I wish I could have written something so fascinating. <laughs> but you already um, have given us such a fascinating talk, honestly. There's so much more to develop. Perhaps there should be another class diving a little deeper in what you were saying. Um, 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 so Vanessa Agar-Jones writes about queer alterity in the Caribbean. 
and and the text is or the the passage that I have saved is we consider sand as a as a repository both of feeling and of experience of affect and of history in the Caribbean region. Here, sand links us unswervingly to place to a particular landscape that bears traces of both connection and loss. So, Amazing. Uh, please, everyone, your questions, put them in Q&A. It's so hard to toggle between chat and Q&A. I see a really good question that just popped up. If you could please just put it in Q&A so we can make sure to read it. Thank you so much. Um, I have another question here. Are there any viable construction material alternatives to sand or ways to more sustainably manufacture artificial sand? So um, what I'm finding is that it's, you can make you can make sand like you can crush rock and make sand, but its edges are really really sharp and it's hard to use it for a lot of things. But it's doable. It's also really expensive and it consumes an incredible amount of energy. Um, so it's way easier, way cheaper, and maybe even environmentally better to import sand from somewhere else than to actually make it. There are movements. There are environmental advocates that said we need to find other building materials. No, and we need to like look at we need to look locally for the materials that work in a particular region or climate. One of the challenges with that though is that regions and climates are changing with climate change. Places are getting warmer, wetter, drier, colder, like depending on on where you are. So people are working on that. Yes, and and waste uh, waste waste as a resource here can play a tremendous role for building yeah. these materials. I've seen great work around. Um, just comp compiling waste and crushing it into a, 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 a form that's very solid, that's perfect for building materials. Anyway, we can go into that another time. <laughs> um, different sand, different continents. Does it make any difference when you do your pedicure with the sand or differently? I don't know what that means, but um, it's an anonymous <laughs> attendee. So. We, we, we can, we can, um, I don't know. Did you talk about pedicure? Not really. No, I don't and know. Do we do pedicure with sand? I'm not sure. This is, this is another avenue of research that's going to open up. Great. Uh, Thank you. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't know how to answer that question. Okay. That's okay. And neither would I. Uh, let's move on. Are there any organizations to support, follow for updates on this issue, uh, global slash regional slash local on the issue of sand, for example? Are there any policies or any sort of regulations or it's like a free market essentially, right? So I think that we're at the early stages of, of more organized actions around sand. It's not to say that they're not happening. They are and, and they will grow. Right now, um, the United Nations Environment Program has some has convened roundtables, special interest groups. Um, there is there are very there are local things that are happening. So in New York, for example, there is Dredge Fest that, like the first Dredge Fest happened, looking at sand mining in Long Island, um, and I think local areas also where sand extraction is a problem are organizing around it. Great, good to know, and especially when you brought it back to New York with the Long Island sand being used to build the city. It's and the lost, the lost uh, beach. Yeah, <laughs> that you mentioned earlier. I mean, that's very crazy <laughs> to yeah. arrive to that point where where did it go? You know, right? It's yeah. Um, there's also an excellent book, and I'll include that in my resources called. The Last Beach, and it looks at what's happening to beaches, not just through sand mining, but through like other other activities and what that means. And it's the worst case scenario that is portrayed in this book, I believe, says that in 90 years, it is likely possible that we will run out of beachfront. So, I mean, Florida is a place where they're running out of beaches. That's it's a huge problem there. So. Last beach, some uh, Krista. Krista posted it. Thank you so much, Krista. We can't wait to get all of your resources. Definitely, Nick and Krista Paloma are all compiling everything. And uh, for those of you who are on Slack, that's where you'll find them. If you're not on Slack, please join our community. That's where we will share everything regarding the Open EDU classes. You'll also receive an email with the resources. Um, question from Beth Labar. 
what alternates are there for sand in building construction? I think we are, I don't know if you have a specific answer, but we have kind of covered that one in, yeah. in a way. Yuhei uh, is asking, what do you say to people who say, well, if sand is such a valuable natural resources, then what's the big deal with desertification? Aren't there ways to utilize man-made desert to our advantage? Um, so again, like I mentioned, that's one of the first things that, like, because that was my response too. Like, what do you mean we're running out of sand? Like, there's a whole, there's all these deserts, just use them. You can't build, like, you can't construct out of desert sand. It is too round. It, the physics of it is different. Um, sorry, what was the question too? Like, what was the second part of it? Oh, desertification. So what, like, with, with desertification, what it means is that like soil becomes unusable and unable to support life. And that's kind of a different challenge. Okay. Yes. Through your research, have you come across a more sustainable material? Again, <laughs> oh, la, la. I think no, that there needs you know to what? be a focus on that. Yes. I think that like that speaks to the anxieties that I might have generated. Like, oh my God, we're running out of sand. It's the end times. What are we going to do? Like, what I think that's what those questions reflect. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know, I don't have answers. I'm just as like anxious as you are. I'm looking for things. I hope that we find, um, I, th I hope that we find a more sustainable way to live because like I had said that Visa wrote, if we are running out of sand, like, and that this is the most plentiful substance that we have, what is going on with everything else? You know, this is, it's just and like symbolic and representative of our overconsumptive habits. That's it. And the scale at which we produce and the, yeah. Uh, unsatiable appetite for new things and bigger things and um it's it's uh you know just both my siblings live in one live in lives in dubai and the other lives in qatar and to also witness an entire city <laughs> rising from the desert becoming such a popular place like to be for so many foreigners and kind of like the center of a lot of businesses that are happening in, in our region. What are your thoughts about the city deserts like that and the amount of artificial um, you know, technologies that it requires? Like for example, artificial rain with those, you know, I don't know if you're aware of it, but like they, they, they fly these jets that create rain in Dubai. Oh, it's called cloud seeding. Um, cloud seeding, that's right. I, so one part of me is like, wow, look at what we can do. But the other part of me is like, at what cost and is it worth it? You know what I mean? Like, it feels like a lot of things are being done for the sake of doing them or being done just because they can and the cascading effects and impacts of those. So like, I look at a city that appears out of nowhere in the desert and I'm like, this is incredible. And then I'm like, well, but what were the labor conditions that produced this? Of course. Oh no. my God, that's a whole other topic, definitely. Right, and I think that being, and it requires thinking beyond the self and it requires thinking beyond, um, like it, it requires being like, well, how does this fit in with everything else? What, what does it mean for me to have this? Like, and am I okay with the price of it? Because our, our, it's willful ignorance now. We just don't want to know because it's so bad, but yeah. Yes, totally. For those that are just now learning about sand, what are some of your recommendations or take uh, action steps we can take? Maybe recommended um, resources. I, I'm sure you're going to include that, but very quickly now, what are some of the action steps that, again, we always get that? What can I do as an individual? Yeah. We always preface by saying, well, <laughs> this is not an individualistic you know, solution. This is not about what can the individual do, but what can we do as a collective? I don't know if you share those same perspective here, but is there something an individual can do so in the this, face of such a systemic big issue? <laughs> um, this is the thing that, you know, we, we all contend with, like it's all good and fine to be like, look, sounds a problem, but, but what do you do about it? Like, first of all, I think just can, like having a self-examination of how sand extraction and its application factors into your own life, you know? So for example, if you are in a position to like build or source materials for a home, 
you can actually find out where the sound is coming from. And I think that lobbying and, and asking for that, if in the same way that it happened with fair trade, you know, like where, where is the sound that is being used coming from? And is it, is it legit? Is it okay? The, the construction business is notorious for not caring about where the materials are coming from because there's so much money and such tight deadlines involved. Um, so regulation is really, really important. I think it's also important to look at the environmental issues related to sand that are in your area. Um, there was a proposed sand fracking mine, um, and that's that's mining sand to be used for, for oil and petroleum extraction in Manitoba in Canada that a lot of people are unaware of, but where the land defenders set up camp. The proposal has... Some people say it's been canceled. Some have said that it's put on hold. The land defenders are still there. They've been there, I think, for three years now to stop this proposed mine from coming. It's a huge site of silica that is used in, in ceremony. And so it's, it's a very significant site. That's something that's local and, and a smaller scale, right? But still related to this huge thing. So I think that's important too. A hundred percent. Could you, if you have a link to that, since it's in Toronto, include it, and we will definitely mobilize around that. If there's a <clears throat> petition we can sign or more awareness we can we can create around this issue, that is absolutely uh, something we can we can do as a community. Yeah. Thank you. I'll include that. Thank you so much. Uh, you talked about a film at the very last of your talk. Is there a way we can rewatch that film? Can you talk to us a little bit more about that film as well? Um, that is one of my favorite films of all time. Um, it's Timbuktu by Abdurrahman Sisako. Um, and it's really interesting to me because it's, it's such a beautiful small scale look at the impact of of militant Islam on a small, like a small neighborhood. But it's also, it's, its scale is extremely local and extremely global at the same time. It's also a beautifully filmed um, movie. But that particular scene contained resonance for me because I was like, I've never, or I hadn't seen, or it hadn't occurred to me that sand could be used in such an evocative, poetic way to stand in for, for an absence or a denial. You know, and I wanted to make sure that when I talked about sand um, and its brutality and the problems associated with it, that I made sure there was something beautiful that included sand to end with. Thank you for that. Oh, it's uh, so wonderful to be able to hear about sand and my mind is just uh, remembering burying myself in very warm sand as I am freezing here right now. <laughs> Uh, what's your favorite memory of sand? Um, when I was in high school, my family lived in Masrat Oman, which is on the Indian Ocean. And so it was just sand everywhere. It was either beach or desert. But when, when I was younger, we would do these community like group picnic trips to oases in the desert. And so, and we would just spend the day there like, underneath palm trees with like the sound of, of fresh water running. Um, and it was, I think that's one of my favorite desert or favorite sand environments to like to ever have been in. Um, and what's, what I'm really liking about sand right now is that people give me random facts about sand all the time and it always feels like an offering. Did you know this about sand? I'm like, no, no, I didn't actually know that. Like, thank you. Um, but yeah. That's so cool. Um, these kinds of reports by a uh, question by Afton Franksik, these kinds of reports and stories are happening around the world in every place and from every angle. Time and time, we are hearing that industry, capitalism, greed worsen life on earth. It weighs heavily on my heart. And the more I'm informed, the more I feel hopeless against the machine. What hope is alive and how can we remain positive in the face of so much loss? What a beautiful question, Afton. I'm sure it is something that's shared globally. Uh, what are your, how can you stay hopeful in this face of a uh, of, of very rapid erosion, let's say, of, of our world? How do you do that question? Um, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm like, this is, this is awful. But then 
I think that being in community with other people, you know, always provides hope. I also am a very strong believer in pleasure and joy, you know, because even despite everything that's going on, there has to be, there has to be some way to find it. I also know that, you know, um, it's pretty awful out there, but I can actually do some things to make it a little bit better and maybe not a lot better, but a little bit. So that's what I do. Like I'll do like what's in my capacity to do, find joy and find your people. Absolutely. And I feel this uh, is sometimes an answer we oftentimes hear, um, oftentimes hear uh, community healing, I would say also like self healing in many, many ways and joy, the celebration of joy and this joy as ceremony in a lot of ways, because we could still find joy, as you said, that was so beautiful. Um, thank you for that. Um, Sri Lakshmi Aravamudan, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, asks, greetings. Thanks so much for this beautiful session. My question is, are there any to minimize the ferocity of this issue? Are there any ways that, to minimize the ferocity of this issue? I think first educating yourself and then finding the closest local action that you can take. You know, and I think that if we if we all do that um, collectively, we can get somewhere. You know, I mean, it's also with sand. Sand's interesting because you're not like mm, use less sand, right? Like it's never an individual thing. It's it's at a much it's at a much larger political scale than we usually have power to affect. And you wouldn't think that usually the, the climate activism is around water, it's around air, it's around things that the human mind imagines consuming and needing daily. It's not around sand because you can't eat it, you know, and, and in, the, in the popular mindset, it's, it equals death in a lot of ways. You know, when you're portraying the end of the world, that's how, again, going back to Dune, not wanting to, but kind of um, this portrayal of the end of the world is oftentimes looking at our region, if you will, and, and just taking a snapshot of it and imagining even the notion of a desert in the, in the popular mind uh, or in popular culture, if you will, in mainstream, it equates to, um, you know, a desert equa equates to death or equates to the end of the world, this ap apocalyptic you yeah. know, vision. When we are looking at the apocalyptic vision of climate change, it's, it's a desert. And we oftentimes use the word desert, food deserts, instead of food apartheid, or um, the, the word desert is, is, uh, is a, has a negative connotation. Yeah. It's, What's your it's, response to that? Because for me, I'm always finding myself having a very passionate fight against whoever is using that term in a negative way or, you know, just taking the opportunity to educate deeply on the fact that it's not. And so what are your thoughts on that? I think we view the desert as like the ultimate terra nullis, which is like this fictive construct that the land is empty, right? But we also see it somehow as a black hole, like you go into it, you disappear. Deserts are transformational and you go into the space of lack and you come back and you're changed if you come back. Um, I think that first of all, the fact that deserts are empty is a complete fallacy. If you've ever lived in one, you spend your life dodging creatures that live in it. Um, I think that also if you belong to desert cultures, you know how rowdy they can get on a, like on a Thursday night. Um, there's so much, like there's so much vibrancy to it. And there's so, it's just a different way of living. And when people confront different ways of living, they prefer to kind of negate them or absent them than to actually engage with them. Um, and I think that anybody who considers the desert in that way, it's completely their loss. Please stay out of it. No. Um, the way that I'm also thinking now of, of Blade Runner, and, and mm. how it portrays LA as this like unsurvivable, toxic desert wasteland, right? But then even within that, you have subcultures and you have insurgency and you have, you know, like ways to navigate. I think I do, I also reject the idea of things like food deserts, but I love the idea of the desert as a site of insurgency, like as somewhere where nobody's going to pay attention to you, as somewhere where there's, you know, the potential to be not surveilled or your activities kept secret because nobody's paying attention. 
right? So I love the idea of that. Um, but I mean, to each their own, I'm not, if you don't want it, it's fine. It's, it can be mine. You don't have to have it either, you know? Mm. Totally. And since you're mentioning Star Wars, I mean, you're not mentioning Star Wars. <laughs> I did not. You're, you're mentioning, you're mentioning um, Blade Runner. Someone has a question regarding Star Wars. You've mentioned being that's a Tatooine. Of Tatooine, <laughs> Star Wars. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the book of Boba Fett shows? Take on its tribal references. Better worth than, worse, sorry, than Dune. And this is a question by you, Hey. I haven't seen the book of Boba Fett yet. I will, and I will come back with an answer to that. I will, I mean, part of this project is also looking at the desert and science fiction, just because, only because I want to write about it and talk about it. Like, give me a platform to talk about Arrakis. Let me talk about Tatooine. Let me talk about Vulcan, you know? Like, soon come. Mm, I love that. Maybe a second class around sand and, um, you know, uh, futurism or Afrofuturism possibly but also the idea of these desert um the idea of the desert is this space to be civilized and tamed and fertilized and maintained and controlled it's all there colonial enterprise critique yes oh my god there's so much we can do here i have two questions back to back one is on mud and the other is also on mud so the first one is <laughs> do you view sand and mud as different things mud is often thought of as a sustainable building material, but after hearing your presentation, I'm not sure any more thoughts. <laughs> this is a question from Taisha Aurora. Uh -huh. is that, you said there were two. And the other one is regarding, uh, in the Amazon, we also have the tradition to build mud houses with sand. It's pretty important for us until now. Why do you think sand is so important for traditional building and now for the permaculture movement? So mud is the is the thing that ties them together, I guess, but um, two different questions for sure. So the first one, uh, do you want me to repeat it? Um, well, I don't know a lot about mud, but mud is not sand and water. Mm. Um, where I come from in Khartoum, they make bricks out of, out of river, river sand, which also includes, um, they make bricks out of a combination of sand, mud, and clay, right? And it differs depending on where you are and its composition. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the, biggest issues with using sand or mud is scale, right? Like, are you using small amounts locally and it's fine and it can be replenished or are you, are you removing it at a faster rate than it can be, like that it can come back at? But I honestly don't know that much about mud. So. And, and regarding it, the question about permaculture and mud, I mean, since you don't know about mud, maybe that is something <laughs> you are not comfortable answering. You don't have to no, answer. I don't, so this is like, um, this is where I have to rein in the scope of my research, right? Because some permaculture soils have a particular percentage of sand and they use that for like sandy, sandy soils will grow different, um, different crops. Like watermelon is something that I learned, but I have to kind of like just stop mm. at a particular space or else I will never get anything else done um, <laughs> at all. And, and I think this is the other thing that I want to impress with my talk we have not reached the stage of civilization, progress, development, whatever you wanted to call it, without sand. And there is nothing that would substitute for that. You know, one of the things that I would like to find out is have there ever been worlds imagined that didn't rely on sand to constitute them? Do you know what I mean? Like we, we don't, it's like saying, how do, you, how do you imagine a world without mathematics? How do you imagine a world without sand? How do you imagine us without language? It's so, it's so intrinsic to who we are universally as a people. Oh, yes. can I follow on from that? Just because there's something I wanted to mention and I didn't. Yes, of course. <laughs> issues with sand are going to take on an extraterrestrial importance. Oh my God, that was my next question. That was my next question, literally. And, and, and there's so many cool questions. There's two questions that I want to make sure we, we touch on. The terrestrial uh, colonization project that already started, if you will, with the amount of waste that the that the world is outputting into space. Yeah, that's one another subject for another time. And actually, we have a, a open edu class this semester touching on that, touching mm -hmm. on waste, uh, uh, touching on space colonialism. But yes. on that point, 
you mentioned earlier, Mars has a lot of sand. And as you know, you know, the United States and other countries, mainly the United States, are trying to get to Mars as soon as possible. One of the questions is, are there real desert planets full of sand and other types of deserts? And are we going to colonize them, we being the global north? So the UAE has explicitly stated plans to colonize Mars within 100 years. So they are, part, like, and like I had mentioned, they are part of the, like the studies that are going on now that are looking at sand and, and weather patterns, right? Um, so I think that talking about sand also means talking about colonial projects. It also means that here is, here is an opportunity to do things differently. I don't, I don't hold out hope that it will, but we can imagine different ways of approaching it. We can. I don't think a new planet and starting over is a solution. I think we need to figure out our problems here first before we go and recreate them elsewhere. Um, but I, but it is something that is going to take extraterrestrial importance too. Also, I mean, um, there are traces of like there's sand on Earth that comes from outer space. Just that's another, another talk. Uh, you 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 hey wrote in chat just now. Did the UAE really say colonizing Mars? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like people are explicitly saying colonizing colonial projects. I mean. I'm assuming that this audience is pretty politically set in a particular way, but a lot of people don't consider colonizing, you know. As a bad thing, of course. A lot right. of people consider it as a necessary evil for evolution. Well, I mean, like, good. <laughs> and also part of like this, this idea of, of building civil society or civilizing, right? Mm -hmm. That's a colonial project, but anyway. Yes, I think I do believe that they use colonizing. I don't I don't think that I'm I'm paraphrasing what they said, but I'm pretty sure colonies, they use the word colonies for Mars, even um, Elon Musk yeah. was quoted in many, many, uh, you know, magazine interviews where, you know, he, he said that um, there's no shame for some of them about colonialism. It's in fact, as I said, you know, part of the civilization, this even this word needs to be dismantled um, or explored. Uh, one question that I definitely want to get to. This was so eye-opening. Why do you think sand isn't a big, oh no, no, not this one, sorry. <laughs> I, uh, can, this was so eye-opening though. Um, can we read the memories of sand? Thinking of jars of sand and dirt I have seen taken from burial sites, just wondering what it can tell us. I am a poet, so I love thinking in this way that sand has a memory just as water does? This is a question for Monica Teresa Ortiz. Hi, Monica. Um, I mean, I love, I love the poetic implications and insinuations of sand. Um, I think that viewing sand as a repository of memory actually means that both literally and metaphorically, like literally in the memories of what the sand was constituted from, and that's, that's the thing about sand, it is always in the process of being broken down or being built up. Right, so it's, it's actually just a particular state of matter. The fact that sand can be made out of so many different things like dead organisms, minerals, rocks, like anything that can be broken down um, is also really interesting. And I like, I like the idea of, of looking at sand. I, I used to be really confused as to why people would, would have this attraction to, to sand, but then I think that having sand also means having part of the land and what it contains and its memory and its spirituality and the emotional resonances that it contains. Yeah. I love it. Thank you so much. I mean, there are so many other questions, maybe a, a question about COP27 being in Egypt. How can this become an important keystone issue in central climate dialogues at COP27 in Egypt? We need perhaps a BOGA-like alliance for such issues and action? This is a question from Ishan. How are you, um, if you are at all, looking at ways to raise awareness about SEN on a political issue, or are you planning of something of any kind for COP27? Or maybe this is an idea for our community to, to, to take on, you know? Um, I am personally not planning anything for COP27, um, but I think that you know, with, with every movement, people have different roles. And, and I see mine as to go out and find knowledge and to bring it back, you know, and then people who know more than I do, 
about action can use that knowledge in ways that benefit us all. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much on this note. Um, one last question. <laughs> can sand become something else without human processing? Yeah. I mean, pressure can create, like, can turn it closer into glass. Like, sand breaks down further into silt. Sand shapes mountains, eh? Like, the wind of, like, sand buffeting against mountains and, and rock, it, it will shape landscapes. So sand does a lot. It doesn't, not necessarily just without us. And I don't know. I don't know what else. Thank you so much, Nehal, for this incredible talk. You're welcome. I am <laughs> so honored to have you and to have this amazing conversation with you today. I'm sure a lot of our community members found this extremely eye-opening. Again, as I said, usually we fight for water and air, things that we can consume with our bodies, but we don't necessarily look into sand as an environmental justice you know, element to fight for or to, to look into. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for enlightening us on that, Nehal. Any last words of wisdom before we say bye-bye? <laughs> um, I actually just want to say thank you to you guys for, for inviting me. Thank you to Nicole and Nick for everything that they did. Um, an immense amount of gratitude for Sarika and Mac, who are just who just held it down so amazingly. Um, and I don't know, I think that I'd love to hear what other people are doing with sand or what they go on to do. I hope this is the beginning of the dialogue. You know, like I said, I'm pretty easy to find and I and I like to be in communication with other people who are doing similar work. Um, and yeah. Thank you so much also to Krista, Paloma, Paloma, who's uh, writing this, uh, the, the best part of this uh, talk uh, on Twitter. I'm sure it was very hard to, to summarize. So, I mean, sorry, I also just want to shout out Coco Guzman and their illustrations. So oh, yes, yeah, right. that was so beautiful. Thank you for it that. Is. We look forward to receiving your list of uh, resources. We would love to discuss with you future classes. Um, we're so deeply, deeply grateful for you. And thank you again, Mac and Sarika. Thank you, Nick, Paloma, Krista, Nicole, <laughs> and Kima, who's not here, but who's also part of our team, and Colin. And thank you so much, Nehal, and to the entire community of the Slow Factory Open EDU. Join us on Slack. It's very easy to log in. We're gonna be sharing a lot of resources. We've actually restructured Slack thanks to Nick and Paloma, Krista, Nicole, who have been putting a lot of love and energy in there, you know, restructuring it, making it more accessible with the information and content. Um, and if you can support open education to keep it accessible and open to all, we would love to invite you to donate if you believe in open education and the access to information and free education. We are so grateful for you as we grow into the next chapter of our life, which is to have a physical school in Brooklyn, which we are kind of pinching ourselves still in this belief that we are getting there. Thank you so much, our beautiful community, and have a wonderful weekend. Bye.